Tone Talk. How's everybody doing today? This is attorney Antonio Moore coming to you from Tone Talks. I want to have a discussion today about Clarence Thomas and what just came out with the ProPublica article. You know, they came out with a prior article a few months ago saying that, you know, he had been possibly taking money, had his relative scholarships paid for. I want to contextualize this around a body of politics that basically has been compromised, both black politics and American politics, and ask the questions, where do we go from here? Where do we go from from here? I mean, that's what we got to ask. Let's get it. So I got people all across this country, and I have to say what is up to you guys, and thank you for your support. Happy holidays to all of you guys. But let's get right into Clarence Thomas. So Clarence Thomas is the Black Supreme Court justice that's been on the court for decades. I want to have a conversation about him, but I'll need you guys to understand what just broke. And what just broke is a possible compromising the government at the highest level. Clarence Thomas threatened to quit the SCOTUS Supreme Court unless he could get rich. So Republican politicians arranged for billionaires to start inundating him with money and gifts in exchange for continued service. So there's three branches. There's the executive, the legislative, and then there's the judicial branch. What has happened as a result of the polarization of politics right and left is that the judicial branch has become extremely strong. And for a long time, it was 5-4 split, which meant that there was a swing vote. What I need you guys to understand is what he was actually negotiating. This man that sits before you was negotiating everything about your politics for his own wealth. So if he had stepped down, say, during Obama's presidency, we would have ended up with a liberal justice and a liberal court. What he was saying is that he was threatening to give America the liberal court it had voted for if they didn't give him some money, in my view. And now we're at a point where everybody has to ask the question, is it time for him to be removed? Understand what that means. It means that we would become the face as ADOS Blacks of, of conspiracy, of not being good enough. We already have the Claudine Gay Harvard stuff with the plagiarism. When do we look at the reality of the consequence of not having wealth, not being a, a production class, not actually having elevated to the heights of these positions? So as a result, we're beholden to the whites, at least those of us that become these positions, and compromise. In my view, again. Again, Clarence Thomas threatened to quit the Supreme Court unless he could get rich. So Republican politicians arranged for billionaires to start inundating him with monies and gifts in exchange for his continued service. That's a quote by this MGJS underscore DC. I believe he writes at the slate. But I'm going to get into the actual article. But the point of this discussion is to frame how problematic this is. I need to get into the specifics of his decisions over the last 10, 15 years. If true, this means the Supreme Court has been compromised, possibly for decades, and, the de and that the decisions over that time involving Thomas all have been tainted. Clarence Thomas should be removed if this holds up. And that's my view. And I believe, I believe this is highly problematic because what Clarence Thomas anchored was a false narrative around a right wing that really didn't exist in any large number in Black America, in Black politics. He allowed people like Candace Owens and the like to say, well, Clarence Thomas is a justice and give a face to a right wing, which now becomes clear never existed. You got black folks around here talking about voting for Trump while they, they kids is in after school programs that will be cut by the Republicans in their district that while their grandmother is on food stamps and needs cheap medicine while their mother, come on, might not have no retirement, but we talking about voting right and conserving the system. So another point of this show is to get into the word conservative and ask you, why do you think you conserving some stuff as broke as you are? Let's go. So we got these decisions that now need to be reevaluated because we got a black face, an ADOS black face at that, at that point was the only ADOS black face now we have another one on the court 
serving as what would be deemed the swing vote. He was not the swing vote because he was hard, staunch Republican right wing, but his vote singularly swung the court. That is what he was negotiating with these billionaires about. The ability to sway politics in a way not even the president can for the next 15 and 20 years. He has to be removed if this is true. And ADOS people have to deal with the consequence that this now is the face of your accomplishment. Just like Claudine Gay is, even though she's not even ADOS. 11, she did 11 papers and then, and then is alleged to plagiarized on five of them. No books. You got Kamala Harris, a junior senator. She the uh, vice president. What is happening in addition to Clarence Thomas, and I don't want to get away from Clarence, is that Ados Blacks in particular never created the amount of wealth. Let's talk about it. Let's get right to it. Those people that have been here on the show know this part, but it's important to understand it. To elevate and ascend to the most elite positions without being compromised because somebody got to put you there, not your own people. So when you look at this chart, black uh, Adolf's people really have no wealth. This little bump is all boomers. I'll show you in a second. But how then are we the president of Harvard on the Supreme Court and a uh, Supreme Court justice, uh, president of America, vice president of America? Well, these white folks in here then use a, a imagery of blackness to undergird their decision making. And black folks like Clarence Thomas agree to it. Clarence Thomas threatened to quit the SCOTUS unless he could get rich. You know, Obama was a junior senator, didn't have a background. He had to use the Clinton engine because he didn't have no undergirding either. You're absolutely right. But today we're talking about Clarence. Let's get right into it. So this decision, so this decision goes a certain way because. He's on the court, Roe v. Wade. So when he says what he says about negotiating, he's negotiating the outcome of Roe v. Wade. A central portion of the Voting Rights Act is unconstitutional. We have five justices versus four. This is an older decision, so Ginsburg and Breyer are still on the court. Thomas serves as both the swing. I know Kennedy was the true swing. But he serves as the number swing and also the optics that holds it together. Otherwise, it's five white men if it's a fifth white man, which is what his politics represents, making this decision to gut the Voting Rights Act in 2023 or 2020 or 2019 or 2015. I don't think we all understand what he did here. If this all holds true, Clarence Thomas has also compromised the image of black politics for decades under a total fraud, presenting the false image of a far right black figure that became the anchor to justify how a group so poor and from slavery could argue for conservative values. What this would mean is he was never Clarence Thomas, as people use him. He was the right wing figurehead. So when I say people, I need to give you an example. It's not just her. It's pretty much the few people that get to speak from the right that there is no right really in black politics because the group is so poor that everything has to change that then get to say, well, because Clarence exists, what I'm saying ain't crazy. Come on. You got this woman. She ain't even well educated and she's running around. Most of the stuff I believe she says don't even make sense. But she anchored herself in Clarence Thomas back in 2019. At the Young Black Leadership Summit, do y'all remember? It was Clarence Thomas. These are the words of, 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 of Candace Owens in her opening remarks. It was Clarence Thomas, Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas in 91, who warned us against what the Democrats. Was it Clarence, though? Or was it his benefactors? Now, I know the article will go into more recent examples, but if this is what his politics, this is what his undergirding is, it was always the people behind him. So many of you guys have decided that you understand politics and did not do no politics in school. They don't really teach politics at, a, at high school level. Me and Yvette Carnell have political science degrees from two very different institutions. 
Yvette has one from Howard. I have one from UCLA. The amount of, of politics you learn at UCLA, I can't even give you words for. But I need to dumb this down a little bit, not because I think you're ignorant, but because you might not know. You might not know that the base word of conservative is conserve. Hold on. Three one zero three eight eight three four nine nine. If you want to speak on Clarence Thomas, so you have a group where the working age people are largely, if not at almost all, abject poor. So if we were to set a number of ten thousand in the bank, probably 98 percent of Black working age people don't have that in the bank account. That is a failed group economically. We know that because we go, we but we can look at this number. Let's let's give it context. So when we see this chart, and this is for the new people, because the people that have been with me know this already. When you see this chart, it has numbers to it. So this little, little bump here, the reason we know it's all boomers is that for the black section from the Federal Reserve Survey of Consumer Finances, come on, from the black section, 2.9, 3 trillion is pension entitlements. Another 450 billion is, is, is mutual fund shares and stocks. That's all we have in stocks and mutual. White people are 36 trillion. You got boys teaching stocks and white folks are the ones in stocks and we trying to eat. He ain't teaching us about eating, but he gonna teach us about stocks we don't have. Come on. Real estate is 2.2 trillion. Whites have 28 trillion. That's pretty much still probably half, if not more, I believe, boomers. Working age black people just here. We just 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 scrambling around, failed politics, failed educational politics, failed tax politics, just failed politics, failed immigration politics. But when you look at it, white America has they have good numbers in each section. They have a, a good split, 28 trillion in real estate, six trillion in consumer durables. They have as much in clothes and TV as all of black America has in all wealth. That's what consumer durables is. Clothes, TV, car. They have 36 trillion in stocks. They got 13 trillion in businesses. We have $310 billion. Herein lies the problem. Again, you can't have a race that has no wealth. In addition, produces none of the items for the society. Have people ascend to be the president of Harvard, the the a lead justice on the Supreme Court, president of the country, without being compromised because they have to be put there by the white folks that have all the means. And this is the most clear example of the problem. You're going to hear a lot of people talk today, and they're not going to contextualize this thing. They're not going to talk to you truthfully and honestly about what this means, about the failure of, of this idea of a conservative black when conservative blacks are conserving things and looking at. So you'll get somebody worrying about gun rights, but their grandmama need food stamps. You got to worry about your grandmama eating first. You'll get somebody worried about gun rights or gay marriage and they kidney after school programs. They kid, not mine. I want to talk. Can I get to it today? I just want to come to you. I want to have this discussion about Clarence Thomas and about how he's been weaponized by people like Candace Owens. And now we find he's not a real man. He's Pinocchio. Goddamn Pinocchio with the strings attached. But we got to understand the base word conserve, averse to change. So you cannot be talking about reparations and be talking about Trump's platinum plan, small government. You can't really be talking about reparations in a real way, like real reparative change and transformation and be a conservative talking about or being averse to change. What does conservative mean? Favoring preservation or the existing order? He told us he had no agenda. Right? His agenda was to preserve this order. That is what Clarence Thomas is. He is the visual hideaway for this. But it isn't just him to me. To me, it's uh, Claudine Gay. It's uh, Barack Obama. It's 
uh, Kamala Harris. It is the ascension of black folks without any kind of transformational change in our wealth condition. Because there's people behind people to ascend that high that leads to when you listen to them, they don't have no politics. I remember talking to family members and asking them, is he transformational? Because I knew he wasn't, Barack Obama. And they would tell me that, mm, uh, just wait and see. No, he's a neoliberal. Do you even understand what the hell you're doing? Has he promised any kind of massive transformational change? We got to wait and see. Well, now we've waited and seen and we're on the other side. The reality is that black America has been bamboozled. And no greater example of that bamboozling exists than this man. If this all holds true, Clarence Thomas has also compromised the image of black politics for decades under a total fraud, presenting the false image of a far right black figure that became the anchor to justify how a group so poor and, and from slavery could argue for conservative values. What this would mean is he was never Clarence, not the Clarence Thomas we thought, he was a right-wing figurehead. Mm -hmm. He told us he had no agenda. When it was coming out, you had one, Clarence. He's supposed to represent the achievement, the progression of Black folks. But there's no wealth, there's no production, there's no community that undergirds his politics. Well, he don't represent any of that. He's just a face man. He's a face man to the point where he became the face of gutting voting rights. This decision is so tainted, it should be redone. This decision on voting rights is so tainted, it should be thrown out, in my view. If this all is true, let's get into what I'm talking about. So I'm talking about this this ProPublica article, I really advise you go read it yourself. A delicate matter, Clarence Thomas' private complaints about money sparked fears he would resign. In early January 2000, Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas was at a five-star beach resort in Sea Island, Georgia, hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt. So he in debt and he on the court. He in debt and he on the court. Let's go back. That is the consequence. So you in the Supreme Court and you in debt. That ain't none but a recipe for you to get compromised. After almost a decade on the court, Thomas had grown frustrated with his financial situation. According to friends, he had recently started raising his young grandnephew and Thomas' wife was soliciting advice on how to handle the new expenses. The month before the justice had borrowed 267,000 from a friend to buy a high-end RV. At the resort, Thomas gave a speech at an off-the-record conservative conference. He found himself seated next to a Republican member of Congress on the flight home. The two men talked, and the lawmaker left the conversation worried that Thomas might resign. Congress should give Supreme Court justices a pay raise, Thomas told him. If lawmakers didn't act, one or more justices will leave soon. You're supposed to get that from your family. I'm not saying that their pay raise won't be in line. All Americans should get a pay raise. But what this represents is that you, Clarence Thomas, did not have the social anchoring to make you an uncompromised Supreme Court justice. One or more justices will leave soon, maybe in the next year. At that time, uh, Thomas' salary was $173,000, equivalent to over $300,000 today. But he was, was one of the least wealthy members of the court. And on multiple occasions, in that period, he pushed for ways to make more money in other private conversations. Thomas repeatedly talked about removing a ban on justices giving paid speeches. Thomas' efforts were described in records from the time obtained by ProPublica, including a confidential memo to Chief Justice William Rehnquist from a top judiciary official seeking guidance on what he termed a delicate matter. We saw the same speech fees from Barack Obama. The documents, as well as interviews, uh, offer insight into how Thomas was talking about his finances in a crucial period in his tenure. 
just as he was developing his relationship with a set of wealthy benefactors. Congress never lifted the ban on speaking fees or gave the justices a major raise, but in the years that follow, as ProPublica has reported, Thomas accepted a stream of gifts from friends and acquaintances. What this man was doing was selling out Black America and America at large. It's an unforgivable act. This man who got his job on the, on, on the backs of black folks being locked out for generations, then used and weaponized that same position to undermine black folks for generations. Precisely what led so many people to offer Thomas money and other gifts remains an open question. There's no evidence that justice ever raised the specter of resigning with Crow or his other wealthy benefactors. George Priest, a Yale Law School professor who has, who has vacationed with Thomas and Crow, told ProPublica he believes Crow's generosity was not intended to influence Thomas' views, but rather to make his life more comfortable. He views Thomas as a Supreme Court justice, as having a limited salary preset, so he provides him benefits for him. Thomas and Crow didn't respond to questions for this story. Crow, a major Republican donor, has not had cases at the Supreme Court since Thomas joined it and has previously said Thomas is a dear friend. Hold on. Everything in business is not just about your personal case going to the Supreme Court, whether it be a tax case, whether it be an abortion case in your personal moral politics, whether it be a religious case. Again, when we look at the conservative body of politics, there's a value system that undergirds it as well. How many of these cases are actually Crow cases in an ancillary way? I need us to have this discussion. I'm reading this article because I don't think you guys understand what has just happened or you would be a lot more mad. Thomas and Crow didn't respond to the question for the story. Crow, a major Republican donor, has not had cases at the Supreme Court since Thomas joined it and has previously said Thomas is a dear friend. David Soko, a conservative financier who has taken Thomas on a vacation on a private jet set in a statement that he and Thomas had never discussed the justice of finances or when he might retire. Thomas comments in uh, 2000 work to Florida Representative Cliff Stearns, a vocal conservative who'd been in Congress for 11 years and occasionally socialized with the justice. They set off a flurry of activity across the judiciary and Capitol Hill. His importance as a conservative was paramount. It's paramount. You know why? Because not just the swing vote part of it, but in addition, it is the visual that then makes it so not only do you then have the creation of a Candace Owens and uh, others that shouldn't even exist, given the rate of black conservatives, not at this level, She's nobody. And then you got him serving as the face when they go to gut main rights for black folks and others. Abortion, voting rights. How does this go over? How does this 5-4 decision go over if this is another white male as, as he what he represents? It does not go over the same in my view. Can we talk about it? I mean, you got to understand. Think about it. Think about it in this sense. Can you really have this Roe v. Wade decision without this woman? That's the level of it. I would think not. Now, it shouldn't be just like one person allows people to feel a little more calm about it, but that's the way it works. I want to talk today and have this discussion. There's an often criticized dynamic surrounding most important jobs in the federal government. The post pay far less than the comparable jobs in the private sector, but officials can cash in once they leave. Ex-regulators sell advice to the regulated. But there's no revolving door payday waiting on the other side of a lifetime appointment to the Supreme Court justice. Uh, to the Supreme Court, justices generally stay on the bench past their 80th birthday, if not until death. In 2000, justices were paid more than cabinet secretaries or members of Congress. So we're making now a logical argument or an argument around what he was thinking and how he was going to be cut out. But we're not dealing with the fact who gives a shit. In reality, when we go back 
Clarence Thomas threatened to quit SCOTUS unless he got rich. What we're dealing with is him threatening to allow the court to represent the actual voting for president, for for uh, for Congress, for uh, the Senate, and appoint a new person. In exchange for him standing there, he want to get paid money that he's not due. They can write it how they want to. Young associates that top law firms made more than Supreme Court justice, while partners at law firms can earn millions a year. So what? Some of Thomas' colleagues were extremely wealthy. Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg was married to a high-paid tax lawyer. Again, this goes back to the cost of being Adolfs and why you have to question, have we done the politics? Did we achieve the wealth to ever have a black president or a Supreme Court justice? I would argue not. It shows right here in the numbers. So you about to have a whole generation of Generation X and millennial blacks that have no wealth. But then look at Kamala Harris, who comes from an Indian and a Jamaican, as a way of measuring our ascension. Or looks at the young woman who's the press secretary that's Haitian. Or looks at Clarence Thomas, who clearly it seems like he's compromised. Or looks at Claudine Gay, who went to Exeter. The same school Mark Zuckerberg went to, Exeter. And had a, 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 a parent who was a nurse, a Haitian nurse, and an engineer, and for those people that don't know, Adolf's women, American descendant of slavery women, were locked out of nursing through the 60s and the 70s. So to work around that, we're going to bring somebody who didn't get locked out of nursing that looks like an Adolf's person. You can go look that up for yourself. They wouldn't let them get the hours in to become nurses. I think Exeter is around $65,000, $70,000. And that doesn't include the extra stuff like fencing and things of the like. Fencing with the sword that, that uh, Zuckerberg did. The full details of Thomas' finances over the, over the years remains unclear. He made at least two big purchases around the early 90s, a Corvette and a house in Virginia on five acres of land. When Thomas and his wife, Jeannie, bought the home for $522,000 a year after he joined the court, they borrowed all but eight thousand, less than two percent of the purchase price. Property records show. You don't have no wealth. You borrowed all the money for the house. And you made it to the court. And how you get picked? You don't come from no money, no family. Damn, you just out here like a chicken with no feathers, like a turtle with no shell, like one of them snails but open backed. You just waiting to get cooked by the sun. Public records suggest a degree of financial strain throughout the first decade of his tenure. The couple regularly borrowed more money, including $100,000 credit line on their house and a consumer loan of up to $50,000 around January 98. Again, we have this decision. A central portion of the Voting Rights Act is unconstitutional and Thomas anchors the decision. Just visually. To understand Clarence Thomas, you have to go back. Shout out to Yvette Carnell. She's covered this before. But let's do it again. He, meaning Clarence Thomas, is a bundle of contradictions. Why Clarence Thomas left the Black Power Movement. When Clarence Thomas received a scholarship to the College of the Holy Cross, a private Catholic college in Massachusetts, there were fewer than 30 black students among more than 2,000 whites. Thomas had watched the civil rights movement unfold. Martin Luther King Jr. and RFK had been recently been assassinated. And as the above expert from Frontline's new documentary, Clarence and Jeannie Thomas, Politics, Power in the Supreme Court, explores the Supreme Court justice, who is now a stalwart conservative, once wrote about his growing anger at racial injustice and the interest in the Black Power movement. In the, in the expert, Thomas, former Holy Cross classmates, say he was inspired by the Black Panther. He dressed like them. He talked like them. He had a beret. He had army fatigues, and he had army boots. Gordon Davis, a former classmate, recalls in the above clips. So he was out here as a full Black Panther. Then he realized he can get that money faking that right. 
Thomas had a poster of Malcolm X in his dorm room. He reportedly boasted that he had read all of the activist speeches and at one time could have quoted some of them by heart. Uh, Thomas was not alone in his frustration with racial injustice at the time. I had evolved from being hopeful to being pissed off. A lot of young people in America was pissed off. Orion Davis Douglas, another of Thomas' former classmates, says in the clip, and they weren't seeking a reconciliation. Okay, they were seeking a coup to change the whole thing. That don't sound conservative. The documentary traces how during an impoverished childhood, Thomas was subjected to racism in the Jim Crow South and was also cruelly taunted by other black children because of his darker skin color. Thomas repeatedly reinvented himself throughout his life. You cycle in your identity, including when he, when he entered seminary with a desire to become a priest and then left disillusioned by the treatment he experienced as one of the two black students. The above clip delves into Thomas' interest in the black power movement during the next chapter of his life at the Holy Cross and when his politics started to move away from it. The black power movement, which began in the 60s, aimed to counter white supremacy and systemic racism by emphasizing black pride and self-reliance. Some groups within the movement embraced Malcolm X's belief that freedom, equality, and justice, come on, Going down a little further, I don't know if he had a well-formed political philosophy before he got to Holy Cross. And maybe he was just simply going along. Glenn Laurie, an economist of, at Brown University, says in the clip, he recalls at that time the forces of conformity to a sense of outrage, fury, resistance, the throwing off of oppression by any means necessary. It was very seductive. Thomas' activism culminated in his junior year when he and thousands of students from the greater Boston area who congregated in Harvard Square for an anti-war protest, there were many protests around the country at that time. I got back to campus at four in the morning, horrified by what I just done, he writes in his memoir. I had let myself be swept up by an angry mob for no good reason other than that I too was angry. Y'all following these confused folk? That moment would prove to be a turning point. And as the documentary goes on to explore, Thomas would set about remaking himself. Pinocchio, he put some new goddamn wooden boots on. He put on goddamn new wooden hands and arms. He said, give me some new strings. And what you realize is he still didn't have no money. The moment will prove to be a turning point. And as the documentary goes on to explore, Thomas would set about remaking himself, embarking on a path that would eventually lead him to finding a place in the upper echelon of conservative politics. I don't think anything about Clarence Thomas is simple, Jane Mayer, co-author of the book Strange Justice about Thomas' nomination, says in the documentary. I mean, he's a bundle of contradictions, and it seems like there's just always so much inner tension within him. Yes, he was radical like his peers. Yeah, he got the wooden boots. The little, you know, you seen the one on Netflix where uh, G G what is it, Geppetto? He in there clanking on them boots. Support the show. I don't know what y'all going to do, man. Y'all got these children. Don't nobody want to be no astronaut. Don't nobody want to be President Biden, the president. He went to Delaware State or whatever. Uh, don't nobody want to be a lawyer or a doctor because we didn't support them. We didn't create no economics. We letting people talk about they don't know about on YouTube. And so we, so everything the same. And now, so what you going to do? You going to give us some money? What you going to do? Because this is, this is in game type stuff. The day it's over. You got this man on the Supreme Court playing the role of Pinocchio. Estimated ideologies of Supreme Court justices. You got Kagan, Jackson, and Sotomayor to the left. Understand that Sotomayor is to the far left of Jackson, who's also married to one of those white Boston families I forgot the name of the family. Oh, let me look that up. I don't even matter the name. All you got to do is see that. Katanji Brown Jackson's ancestors were enslaved. Her husbands were enslavers. All right. So this is what we doing. And this is not a normal family. They're deep into Boston uh, elite. So I don't think this is just normal. I'm just telling you today, when I look at this discussion, I don't understand why we're not talking today. 
We can talk about Cardi B and Offset. And we can talk about the Amon Shumpert and the Lady T Taylor, whatever the hell she. They took all the damn pictures together. Now they and we gonna talk about them falling out. They ain't f***ing news. We can talk about Jada Pickett and Will Smith, but we don't know what to do with this real stuff that you're supposed to be talking about at 40, 50, 60 years old. I just wanted to come to you, have a discussion, and explain how this man has compromised black politics and anchored a false narrative around a right that has so little numbers that it shouldn't even be in the national dialogue of a, a, a black right. And in addition, how he reflects the failures we're seeing across the board with the plagiarism, with the Harvard president, with all kinds of questions about competence and other things, because then we never undergirded this. We are allowing for this not to be fixed. And as long as that's not fixed, you ain't got nothing at all. This is Tom Talks. Please go to tomtalks.net, subscribe, donate, and share. Thank you so much today.